topics from your current projects, so we hopefully can answer them. Uh, if you have any questions during my talk, please just raise your hand. We can talk about it. If you have some more deeper questions, you can save them to the Q&A. Uh, and if we want to talk okay. plans for world domination, we can do it at the pub afterwards. Because we usually go into the pub with the floor lamp, which is a couple blocks away so, from here. So, if you like, I'm going to the pub afterwards, so we can have a beer and we can have a shot. So. Okay. Uh, back in 2002, I was uh, building this huge system for a large, uh, large insurance company in Sweden. Uh, we, were, we started off using BB6 and Complus, but well, we got some parts to work, but uh, it's, after a while we moved over to .NET. Uh, and one day, the chief architect got back from a course and said they had, had this, this book of miracles with him. So we all looked into this book and it was this book. Uh, he had got, got it from a course he took at Microsoft um, and we really felt that we needed some guidance because we were just hacking things. We were used to coding in VB6 so we, just, we, we were hacking. So we needed some more structured way to, to code. So in that book we found this classical picture, the, a diagram of the layers you might want to have in your application and everything really made sense to us. We had the users up on top, yeah, we had users, check. Uh, we need some U UL logic, check. We have distance logic, everything seemed to match our, our own uh, requirements here. Yes, we had a database down there. And of course, being an insurance system, when you sign up people for insurance, we need to check a lot of things. We need to talk to claims, we need to talk to billing, we need to talk to almost every other system at that insurance system. So we were doing a lot of integrations. And it seemed pretty easy. We, we had that, that box down there, services. Um, we even put some ASP, uh, ASMX services, I think. The first version of the web services. We even put some web services in front of our services. So we kind of bet it quite hard that this picture would, would give us what we want. Um, well, the, the thing is, everything seemed to work out really, really well. Everything went smoothly in our test environments. And, and the testers were happy, we were happy. Uh, have you guys play, played a game called uh, Simulation? Yeah, I think everyone has played a game called Simulation. Well, when you play that game, usually you have some, some, some patch of land and everything is really fine, you have your cities. And usually there is this black spot on the map and you know, if you go there, it's going to be some old ancient tribe. It's going to throw spears at you and they try to negotiate with them and then you're just going to try to fool you. You know, if you go down there, it's going to be trouble. Well, that is kind of the problem we had. This is, this is where the trouble started because one day we had one of the testers come back to us to say, uh, <clears throat> well, I was, I was testing uh, your system and, and if the billing system isn't answering, uh, you're rolling back your database. But for some reason, we're still billing the customer. Okay, uh, so, well, that's my, that must be a glitch in the system. So we started investigating it. And it turns out that web services doesn't do transactions. So even though we rolled back things from our own database or all our web service call, calls, they were not rolled back. So we were charging customers. We were, tell, we were telling the government that the that the people had a car insurance, even though we didn't have a car insurance. So the business didn't like that, so we need something else here. And but another problem as well, because in our test environment, everything was very fast, but it turned out in production that when you talk to the government, you do it over a dialogue connection through the mainframe over a 4,000 4, pound dialogue modem. And it turned out when we had our peak loads, it wasn't fast enough. So, if we go back to our laid, uh, laid architecture again, I think, I'm not playing Microsoft here, I'm just saying that this image looked, looked a little bit too simple, so we should really change it to something like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know we have our database, that is usually a stable thing, it's probably clustered, so it's going to be in there. But 
But just drawing services to the right there, you get the kind of impression that, oh, this is going to be some stable things that are always going to be there. They're going to have a nice response times. Everything is going to be nice and clean. But I can tell you, when you do external integrations, there will be, there will be dragons. Yeah? So we're going to talk a little bit about dragons and some facts about dragons. Um, I guess the first fact could be related to one of the fallacies of distributed computing is that there's a fallacy called uh, um, that you always assume that latency is uh, zero, but it turns out, at least in our case, that having a service on our own network compared to a dialogue modem to another governmental agency, there were quite a lot of la latency when we, did, when we did that call. So, usually when you deal with dragons, a trip down to dragon territory can, can really take a while. Uh, so let's look at some classical code. This is a service bus code. It's perfectly nicer, it's, it's refactored, so every shopper is really happy. You could even claim it's, it's, it's good domain driven design. We are creating our order. Uh, we are asking FedEx to, to, to ship the order for us. We're getting back the tracking code from FedEx. And we, set, we are setting the status to ship, and we store the order in our database. Looks pretty clean, yeah. <clears throat> well, there is a problem here because what, what, what really looks like two lines of code here, when you are when you are at your own computer in test environments, it's usually when you step over those two lines, it's really quick. But the problem in reality, it could be quite a lot of time between between those two lines of code. And by coding, by coding in this way. You, you're really hiding the fact that this could really take a long time. Some external services can take up to a couple of hours to complete. So just hiding them behind a, behind a synchronous response re request response protocol is really hiding the fact that you need to be doing really something else here. Um, Well, the next fact, we already talked about that. Dragon doesn't do, trans Dragons doesn't do transactions. And, and they shouldn't either, because why would they like to, to have resources waiting for your stuff to complete? So if you ever do integrate with a third party and they agree to, to at least your transactions, I would say that that is usually a sure sign that, that they don't know what they're doing. Yes, there is things like WS atomic transactions, but I don't see any need for that protocol because it shouldn't really be used. External calls, external parts should never actually en enroll in each other's transactions. So let's take a quick look at that code we just saw and, and see what what will happen in case of a, because you know as we all know databases will roll back at some point in time. There can be not enough disk space, it could even be a deadlock. I mean deadlocks are expected to happen. So in our case here, we got the order in. Uh, we talked to ship, we talked to FedEx. We got back the tracking code. We stored it in the database. But if our database rolls back, our main transaction is going to roll back. So if you're using a service bus, it's going to put the message back on the queue. But we have a little problem here. FedEx isn't going to roll back. Okay, so now now we're in a situation where we. We don't have an order in our database, but FedEx is going to come and pick something up here. Well, this is just costing your business money. But the problem is, if, if this was billing and you were charging a, a customer's credit card, there might be a problem if you charge it twice. Yes, you are making more money, but the customer is probably going to be pissed off. Yeah. So we need a way here to make sure that we can handle rollbacks if in, a, in a much better way. Uh, but, but before that, let's talk a little bit about, about this part. If you weren't, if you weren't using the service bus there, and this was a, just a regular HTTP call, <coughs> and we roll back, where will that order be? In the log. Yeah, it might be in the log, but it's, it's still going to be in the, in, in the user's browser, at least. If this is the website, the order will still be in the browser, yeah? So then we are hoping that the user will click that button again, place order. 
But you know, we have, we have gone to, very, to, to great length to train our users not to click that button once, twice, you know? Please wait, don't click that button twice. That's kind of the, the things we, we've been telling our users. So, well, if they don't click the button again, we, we have lost the button. So the really good way to do this, of course, is to make sure that you pull the user data off HTTP as quickly as you can and store it somewhere durable, perhaps in a queue. Yeah. So by using Messier, at least we have the order now. Yes, we have a problem with FedEx doing multiple shipments for us, but we can, we can handle that. As long as we have the order, we, we can handle every situation. So, using a service bus, we have this, gui this design gui guideline saying if you do want to interact with the non transactional resources, make sure to move that code to its own separate endpoint, which only has the responsibility of talking to that non transactional resource. Could be web service, it could be some strange single threaded compass DLL that some old guy that, that I left the, the company 10 years back wrote. Anything that doesn't support transactions, move that to separate them. So, if a shopper had a extract endpoint, it will hopefully look like this. Uh, so it's almost the same code here. We're still saving the order in the database, but instead of talking about with, directly with FedEx, we are sending a message instead to some other endpoint that that we are going to build that is responsible for talking to FedEx. So what we've done now, instead of hiding the fact that things can take time and can fail, we've kind of made it very explicit. We're sending off a message here. So everyone will know that, yeah, we send off a message, we never know when this response is going to come back. It can come, it can come back in a second, five hours or two days later, we don't know. But now at least it's, it's explicit. So we, but we've done a couple of other changes as well. Uh, we had to go back to our, to our business and ask them if it is okay for us to add an extra status. <coughs> so instead of saying shipped right away, we have another status now saying that we are awaiting shipment. So that will give us some time to talk to FedEx. Because usually when you talk to a business, they can wait a couple of hours before the shipment is booked. As long as the order is safe, yeah, we can wait a couple of hours before we book the shipment. The other part is, of course, to, to send off a message to another endpoint. They'll, 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 they'll talk to FedEx for us. And of course, when we do get that shipment back, the tracking info back from FedEx, we have another message handler that is responsible for getting the message, loading the order up from the database, setting the tracking code, and storing. So, so the, those two lines of code are now two different messages. So, let's take a quick look and see how that affected uh, the flow here. So, we still got this order coming in. It's storing it in our own database. And we're sending off a message to our own endpoint that is going to talk to FedEx for us. So, it seems like a quite small change. So, instead of doing a, a quick HTTP call, we're now sending off a message. What's going to happen now that if the database rolls back, possibly because of a deadlock or something bad happened to the database, a critical Windows patch or whatever, our distributed transaction is going to roll back as well. And because sending a message or a message queue is also a transactional operation, the message is going to be rolled back from the message queue. So this means now we have consistency. If we roll back from the database, we're not going to talk to FedEx. Yeah. So, a couple of lines of code more, and, and now we don't have the problem of talking to FedEx and credit card companies multiple times. Sorry, talking to them without storing our own order. So we can get the order safe in the database, then we talk to others. Uh, <coughs> Another fact about Dragons, if you go on a raving party, there's a, quite a big chance that some of you guys won't be coming back. Uh, 
I haven't been on one, but I've read books that say that going down to Dragon Country is usually quite quite dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so we have now solved the problem that we're booking things for orders that, that, that we haven't stored. So now we know that yeah we have an order, but we have another problem now because uh, we're still talking to FedEx here using HTTP. What, what do you guys think will happen if their, that response gets lost on the way? It could be a router, firewall, or just a plain timeout. Will we know? Do we know if FedEx has got our request or not? We don't, we're just getting something back saying timeout exception. Can we be sure that our first call didn't reach FedEx? We have no way of knowing. So the only thing we could do here is, is to retry once more. And, and, and this is taken care of by the service bus. It's going to roll back to the queue, it's going to retry a couple of times. But you know, we have a problem now. We might end up calling FedEx twice here again. We haven't lost the order, no, but we might still call FedEx twice here. Uh, Because it could be that our call reads FedEx, they are committing their stuff, creating, generating a shipment for us, getting us and us back in uh, tracking code, <coughs> but it gets lost. So we need to have a way to make that call item potent. Does everyone know what item potent is? Yeah. Well, it means that we should be able to retry operation without causing any unnecessary side effects. So if you do a, if you use two plain reads, they're naturally item potent because reading data shouldn't update any state. But, but in this case, when we are calling FedEx, we are actually updating state, state uh, over at FedEx. Uh, the only way we can solve it is by collaborating. The dragons at FedEx really need to be having the protocol that a way for us to send them an ID so that we can tell FedEx this is shipment for order X. If we have that ID, that if, if they commit and for some reason we don't get response back, when we retry, we are going to retry with using the same ID. And that means that FedEx can just drop that request and send us back a, a, an OK response. So you need to find a way to get get some kind of ID that, that is you need to use the same ID across the requests. So and one thing good thing to use is the message ID that comes from the service bus because we are making sure that when we are retrying, you're gonna get back the same message ID. Even if the message fails more than X times and, and gets sent to our arrow queue, when you when you return a message back to the original queue to retry a couple of hours later. We are going to make sure again that that message will get the same ID. Does it make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. So, in the example where you had the, you commit to the database and then send a shipment to FedEx, yeah. you said that if the database had a problem, then FedEx would roll back. But if the message handler for FedEx had actually called, the FedEx service, how would that roll back? Uh, you're talking about, about this picture, yeah? Hang on. Uh, so you're seeing here that we, we send this message over to FedEx? Yeah. And this database rolls back here? Yeah. yeah. The thing is, because we're using a distributed transaction here, this message isn't going to be put on the queue until the whole transaction commits. Yeah. So we have a distributed transaction that works against both the database and the queuing system. So it's not that the handle there will run and then... No. Yeah. No. So in this case we'll be using distributed transactions and there might be issues, issues there because it's hard to configure DTC but it's going to save you a lot of code that is kind of tricky to write. Yes, if you guys are using event sourcing it's much easier to get rid of distributed transaction. But I guess we can save it for another great talk. Perhaps Chris Greg Young can tell you about that. Uh, so for those of you that listen to the distributed podcast, every show we have a debate between me and Jonathan Oliver about if the decision should be used or not. So 
if you're interested in more discussions about DTC or not, you're free to listen to our podcast. Okay? Was it, did I answer your question? Good, good. Okay, another dragon fight. Uh, a trip down to Dragon Country can really be expensive. You need to build all those boats, train all those men, and put together a, a raiding party and go down to the dragons and try to kill one. So, the same goes for communications to external parties. It could be costly, both in terms of money, FedEx might charge you for each call you're making. So, if you have some problems with your own firewall and you're hammering FedEx, they might decide to charge you for each call, and they don't care if you have a firewall that is dropping your messages. It could also be that you're talking to a device with a limited battery time, so you don't want the retry. You want better control on uh, how often you do retries. A service bus will do five quick retries by default. So sometimes you want much better control of that. You just to avoid unnecessary costs when talking to those external services. Uh, so we need a way to, to do timeouts. And thread of sleep is usually not the best way to do to wait because that's going to keep valuable worker threads hanging up just doing sleeps if you have a problem with, the, with, with any external partner. And it could also be that we, that we just crash and come spunk up again. So we need to make sure that we have timeouts that is durable so that if we do crash, we still don't know when is the next good time to, to, to do a retry. And this is something that the timeout manager that comes with the service bus solves for us. We're going to look a little bit more into detail, into those details a little bit later, but you can, the easiest way to explain the timeout manager is it's like an alarm clock where you send it a message saying, can you please wake me up in one hour? And then the timeout manager is going to hold on to a message and when hour, one hour passes, it's going to send it back to you. So it's a, mess, it's a message based alarm clock really. And those Timeout messages are stored on disk, so even if things crash, we're still going to remember that timeout value. Uh, another dragon fact. Uh, the dragons always have home turf advantage, so when you talk to them, they are calling the shots. They have their API and their protocol, and you just you just have to have to obey. And in order to keep their, their SLA, they're usually, I'll say, very advanced and well-behaved dragons are, are usually trying to throttle you because they have a, usually a tight SLA. So they need to make sure that if they're yet, if, if for some reason they get load peaks, that they are throttling the load in order to, to maintain their SLA. So if you go with both the dragons, it's usually quite a narrow entry to the dragon kind. Uh, so to better understand the dragons here, we need to kind of switch positions for us. So, so let's imagine that you guys are designing an external web service. And your marketing guys are pushing things onto Twitter, so you're expecting that it could be some really high loads here. Uh, so we need to find a way for you guys to manage your traffic peaks, and also wait so that you could can, can control the pace here. Because if you just allow load, loads coming in without limits, sooner or later we're gonna get overloaded and, and, and stop responding. So we're gonna look at, at, at a small pattern on how you can build your own external services that are highly scalable. Uh, we're gonna I mean, uh, doing request response that, that does make a lot of sense over the internet. So we, we're going to use request response, but we're going to introduce more of an application protocol where we are redirecting our users to our own little protocol in order to make us more scalable. So the first part is when we're getting a request in, we're not, we're not going to give them data back right away. We're just going to queue up their request. So we're going to use the fact that on a single box, you can probably do around 7,000 cents to a queuing system per second. Which means that your web service should roughly be able to handle around 7,000 requests per second. And that's usually scalable enough. So we're not sending, 
in, this, in the FedEx case, we wouldn't be sending back the tracking code to the user. Instead, we would be sending back a ticket saying, hey, I got the response. Here's your ticket. Can you please check back in, uh, in T minutes, T seconds, T hours, whatever? Because then, when we do process the message, which we can do, of course, at our own page, uh, pace, because we have tuned it up so we can have a couple of worker servers, there's just pulling the load up, and when it's done, it's going to send the message back to our web servers, which is just going to cache the response, and just wait for our users to come back and, and, and pick it up. If you guys have heard of CQRS, this is a little bit CQRS-ish, so we are separating our commands from our queries in order to be more scalable. So then our client will hopefully obey our protocol and go for sleep for some period of time. And uh, when he's waiting long enough, he's going he's gonna to come back to us to pick up his data. So what we're going to do then, we're going to feed the data from our cache back to the user, or it might be that we are we are experiencing high load, high load right now, so we might not be done yet. So then we can tell them, oh yeah, sorry, we're not really done yet, so can you please come back to T2 instead? This gives us a great way to control the pace, because in, uh, in high uh, performance scenarios, we can, we, can, we can use a higher value for T. So by measuring the loads on our servers, we can increase the T, and thereby have our clients back off a little bit. And, for, and if we don't have that much load, we can use a lower T to give a better service to our users. But this enables us to, if we do get high peaks, we're just going to queue them up at our servers. So we're not gonna, we know we're not going to do the real business plugin yet. So we're just queuing them up in the queue. So as long as we have this, this space left on our web servers here, we're good to go. Well, keep, keeping the C drive uh, Keeping space on C drive is usually a huge problem for admins, but well, that is the only thing you need to worry about. Keep, keep this space left on, on, on C drive, it should be fine. Uh, another thing to, to note is that, um, is that this cache here, you're not forced to use the same web servers to, to serve. You can actually redirect your users to, to other servers. I mean, you could use MongoDB down there, or you could serialize responses as JSON to your CDN. And you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with that response. And again, this is CQRS at work here again. We do our commands through a separate channel, and we do our responses through another channel, possibly using different technology. Again, if we do have a dragon that has this funny protocol, then well, we need to obey it. So we need, we, we need to start following this protocol. And now we get into uh, where a saga makes sense. A saga and service bus is a way to synchronize messages. So it's a chance for you to write logic that control when message A comes in. What should we do? Should we send out another message? Should we wait for a minute? Well, you can see it as, as a state machine, a message given state machine. Uh, so if we were to implement this using a saga, we would, we would, just, we would kick the saga off when the book shipment message comes in. And we're going to send the message to our, our own FedEx endpoint. And the response to that guy is only to do synchronous request response with FedEx. So we send a message off, and that endpoint is going to talk to FedEx. And if he gets a ticket back, he's going to send it back to us. So assuming everything goes well, we get the ticket back, we need to sleep for a period of time. This is the part where we can use a timeout manager. So we're sending another message to our own timeout manager saying, hey, can you please wake me up in 10 minutes? So the side goes back to sleep again. And 
and after one minute, uh, we, we're going to be, or, or we're going to get the wake up call. So the message is going to come back to us. The saga is going to wake up and it's going to be, okay. Okay, so I got a ticket and now I'm waking up from a timeout there. So it's time to try to get down to FedEx and fetch our sponsor. So it's going to send another message to FedEx saying get data. And hopefully FedEx will get the data back to us. So, yeah, it's a lot of message going back and forth there, but as we're going to see soon, the code is that simple. It's just a couple of lines of pure C sharp code. Nothing complicated here. So, we're really relying on the robustness of MSM, Q, and the service bus to help us with all the infrastructural details here. So, this is really the essence of Sagas. Being a state machine for messages coming in and out, and also supporting timeouts. So we're gonna take a quick look at some code. Or are there any questions before we look at the code? Otherwise, something's wrong. 
So this tells us that we need to, when this message comes in, the infrastructure need to find the correct Saga instance that is responsible for this, this uh, response. Wait, dehydrate it, load the state back up from storage, and pass the, um, pass the message to your message handler. And in order to do that, we need to, you need to tell us how, we got, how, based on that message, how are we going to know which Saga instance that we should look at. So let's look at that very quickly here. <coughs> Response received, received. That was the it was the message uh, that we were expecting. So here we're telling, we, first of all, we are just overriding the configure how to find Saga map. In there, you, you'll get control over how we do Saga lookups. So in there, you'll be telling the infrastructure that when a FedEx response received comes in, take the order ID from that message, go into your Saga storage, and try to find a Saga instance that have the same order ID as the order ID in the message. So this is the place where you tell us how you want us to, to correlate things. Yeah. So it's strongly typed and hopefully no room for errors. So this is where you tell us how to find your, the correct SAG instance. And when we've done that, we're going to call your method. So, so we did find your Saga instance in our storage. We're gonna, we're gonna get your state back from storage, and we're gonna call this method. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna pick the receipt we got from FedEx. We're gonna store it locally in our, in our, in our Saga data here, and have a service bus persist that for us. And then we're going to set a timeout. So given the, the pick up time, pick up time that FedEx sent us. We're, gonna, we're going to request a service bus. We're going re, to talk to, to the alarm clock in the service bus and say, hey, can you please wake me up at this time? It could be a time span or it could be an absolute time. Okay, then we're going back to sleep again. So that message went down to the, to, to, to the service bus timeout manual. And when the time is up, the timeout manager is going to see that and it's going to send the message back to us again. What's, what's the null? What's, what's the uh, uh, yeah, good, good question. Uh, null is you can pass additional state to the timeout. Okay. So if you're, for, if you're for some reason have multiple timeouts, you can give the timeout manager some state and that state is going to be passed back to you so that you can know if this is timeout X or, or if it's timeout or something else. It could be timeout because we did fail to, to contact the first FedEx call. So it might be another timeout where you're just retrying something. So that is a way for you to, to have some additional state that gets passed around with, with, with the timeout message. If you never received a response from FedEx, yeah. what, what would happen there? Uh, yeah. I think we need to move back to the slides to explain that. Uh, okay. It's a good question. So, uh, so, so the question was, what will happen if we don't get a response back from FedEx? <coughs> So, I guess we're talking about here, something goes wrong there. Yeah. What will happen then is that the service bus, because this is a, a service bus uh, import, it's going to retry the configurable number of times. Five. We're going to do five quick retries if you want. If you don't want to do five retries, you can con configure a service bus to just do one retry. So, so if we assume that making call to FedEx and costs money, we're going to set this endpoint only to do one retry. It's going to use four months. And if that retry fails, that message is going to be moved to the error queue. So you're usually going to have a one central error queue in your system. 
So that message will be moved to that error queue, where uh, an administrator will look at that message and determine what to do. My call FedEx say, okay, we have, we have some problems talking to you. Oh, okay, I, our web server were down. At some point in time, that administrator will decide to retry that message. So it's going to use a tool called return to source queue. It's going actually to pull that message off that error queue and feed it back in here again. And the process will continue. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But this is actually the place where you start, need, to start to, need to start to talk to your business and say, okay, but uh, what happens if you can't talk to FedEx in, in, in a couple of hours? Because that is going to that's probably going to get them to start to think about other scenarios. Then some, then, then they might say, okay, well, well, let's give FedEx four hours. If we haven't been able to book a shipment with FedEx in four hours, we're going with UPS instead. They're a little bit more expensive, but hey, we need to ship that order. And if UPS doesn't even work in eight hours, call some of the guys for shipping up, have them take their private car and stuff bags in the back and just drive to the customer. Yeah. And this is one of the, you asked about state to the time of manager. So you can actually have this logic in the saga. So you can have multiple time, timeouts. It could, be, it could be a timeout that you, you were doing because FedEx told you so. It can also be a timeout for four hours. And if that timeout happens, you are going to not do FedEx anymore. You're going you're gonna to send a message off to your UPS endpoint instead. So that is also a perfect fit for your saga. So usually when there is time involved, because time is usually a business requirement, if you talk to your business and they say, okay, well, in X hours you should be doing that, that's a sure sign that you should be using a saga. And in this case, we're using saga more as, an, more as controlling our integrations, but sagas are extremely used for, for, for your core business logic as well. But I guess that is a topic for, for another night. So, <laughs> Quick, quickly back to Pro here again. I just want to show you a couple of more things. Uh, So uh, we set the timeout. FedEx told us four minutes. Four minutes has passed, so we get in the message back. The infrastructure will automatically know because we're passing the saga ID with the timeout message. So you don't need to configure anything. And service pass will know that this saga belongs to this instance. So uh, a service pass will wake you up. And it, it was, I will call this timeout method. So you will be overriding the timeout method. And any state that you did pass in is going to be passed in onto it there. So if you want to separate timeouts, FedEx timeouts from more business timeouts that are the four hour timeout where you're going to switch over to UPS, that state will tell you that. In there we're just checking if we do have a receipt. Then we just send another message to our FedEx endpoint to fetch the, fetch the data. So as we see, we're not doing any real, real business logic in our saga. We're just controlling the message flow. And we are offloading the real world to other endpoints. Just, so saga endpoints shouldn't really be talking to any databases, making any web service calls. It should only be about Message comes in, should we set a timeout, should we send out other messages? Because receiving and sending a sending message are enrolled in the same transaction. They make sure that each time we wake up, we either gonna succeed, process the message, and send out messages, and or everything is gonna roll back. So we are we are ensuring that we have asset compliance for each method in the saga. So each little step of our business process is going to be guaranteed consistent. Um, so the bus will send that shipment detail message. Yeah. Um, could it be have put that in the handler for when 
fetch or FedEx response received received message? Why is it in the timeline? Yeah, because uh, so the question was why couldn't we just send that one off right away when we got the receipt back from FedEx? Yes. Well, that is because the protocol that FedEx has requires us to wait for a certain amount of time before we call them, right? So FedEx is telling us to, can you please back off a little bit? Because we are quite loaded right now. So can you wait five minutes before you come, we go check back, check back in? So yeah, you could call it right away, but then you're not obeying the, the protocol and you might get bad. <laughs> uh, well, so hopefully this gives you an idea of what, what Cyrus is useful for and how you could use it in combination with the service bus to make sure that your integrations are not dropping messages, still working if you have a high latency. So you're kind of leaning on the robustness of a service bus to make what is usually quite unstable external partners act to your own system, system like they were transactional, well-behaved, performant endpoints. So we're just hiding away all those dragons behind messaging. So if you do this, uh, you hopefully be like this guy. I mean, dragons are really powerful. So instead of you guys building your own building systems, building your own building your own shipping organization, you can actually use those dragons so, so that you can do really good for your business. So dragons are really good. So if you if you know how to handle them, yeah. you could actually uh, you can see you, you can have great use for them. Um, that was all for me. So, thank you so much. So we're having a Q.